Welcome to another episode of The Vegan Pulse. I am your host, Nancy Arenas. Today, my guest is Peter Egan. Peter is a British television actor best known for his roles in Ever Decreasing Circles and Downtown Abbey. Peter had been vegetarian for eight years before going vegan in 2016 after participating in Veganuary. Since then, he has been an outspoken animal rights advocate campaigning tirelessly for the animals and supporting many causes and organizations. Stick around. I want to introduce him to you. Hi, Peter. How are you? Hi, Nancy. I'm very well. Thank you. Very well. Nice to be on your show. Oh, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you on the show. And I know that you are familiar to many people. And I wondered if you might share your journey into veganism um yeah okay uh it, uh, it started specifically well, i watched a film called earthlings which is voiced by wakam phoenix as you probably know and earthlings is a extraordinary documentary which deals with all species involved with intensive animal agriculture so it's basically about the slaughter of animals um, and I watched it about 12 years ago, and it was, I was so upset by what I saw, um, by the cruelty, by the lack of any kind of kindness or empathy for these wonderful creatures that um, as soon as I finished watching it, I'm, I, I was watching it in the kitchen of our house in London when we lived in London. My wife came in and she thought I'd had a heart attack or something because I could hardly speak. And she said, what's the matter? And I said, I've just watched this extraordinary film and I'm never going to eat meat again. And I haven't eaten meat since then. And that started my journey. Thank you. And I, uh, that started it. And I, I then progressed from that and then learned once you open one door into this area, it, it leads to many other doors. And um, I then went into the door mark fish and the Dormark Dairy, and, and so over the next couple of years, I took them all out. So I've been um, a, a vegan proper, for want of a better image, for the last nine years, basically, and um, I don't regret a single thing. I, the only thing I'm sad about is that I didn't do it earlier. I wish I'd started earlier. And do you mi miss the meat? No, not at all. I know that's like one of the misconceptions that people think you drop it and then you're going to miss it. You're craving it and you don't. And you don't at all. Yeah. People say, well, the common thing is people say, oh, you're, you're, you're going to miss bacon. You can't, you can't live without bacon sandwiches or eggs and bacon or, you know, stuff like that, or your Sunday roast or your, you know, and um, no, I, I, I just regret the fact that I, that I indulged myself with all of that for so many years of my life. Um, and also, when you think about it, I mean, m most people eat, m the meat they eat is disguised in one way or another. It's either covered in gravy or it's, you know, between slices of cheese and stuff in a bun or in a stew and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, you can do all of that with um, plant-based products. So, you know, there's nothing to miss and there's everything to gain. But one thing in specifically that I really gained was my digestion became much much more happy and natural my i i always felt a degree of indigestion when i was eating meat and then possibly a bit of you know acid reflux stuff like that but it was once i cut it out after a couple of months i sort of found my stomach saying thank you <laughs> it was you know it was really much happier being the host to my body and uh, and it, everything sort of balanced out much more uh, completely and much more comfortably. It's um, uh, the best decision of my life. And that's like you said, because now your stomach was happy because you were actually eating the food that's intended for us. Exactly. Absolutely. But well, we have the same intestine as cows, don't we? I think so. It's, we're suited for grazing and not eating flesh. And the other thing that you said is, which I keep trying to tell people, really, what when people are eating meat and all these other animal filled products they're always showing it especially on tv the oozing cheese the sauce they're not necessarily like right on the meat because is as you said is the sauces and the 
you know, and everything that you put on top is really yeah. what we it's, like. Yeah, absolutely. It's all the flavors and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, but specifically, I find I have to say what I really, really love, apart from the great, great variety of food choices, um, the thing that I like, love about being a vegan is my head is connected to my heart. Um, there's no obstruction between what I feel and what I eat. And I daily um, am aware that I don't have any cruelty on my plate. And that makes me feel within myself very content and very happy. Yeah, I've become much more happy ever since I became vegan. And it's because of yeah. what you said. All of a sudden, like we're actually connecting to a real self. Absolutely. How long have you been vegan? I have been vegan about eight, uh, eight going on nine years. Oh, about the same as me. It's good. Right. And I went vegan for the animals. Um, Obviously. And, and I haven't regretted it, mm -hmm. except not doing it sooner, like you said. Absolutely. Well, it is remarkable, isn't it? I mean, the cruelty and also the sense that we have as human animals, that we have this dominion over all other species on this planet. And it is that aggressive sense of dominion that is making us um, destroy our ecosystem and destroy our planet. So um, opting for a plant-based lifestyle is not only healthier for us, it's healthier for the planet with, with, with whom we share. You may hear one of those species, my little dog in the background. <laughs> well, the dog. And, and, and you are such a great animal activist, um, such a past, passionate person on behalf of the animals. And I wanna thank you for that. Um, and I know that you've rescued and been involved with some dogs from Bosnia. Yep. Um, um, yeah. Look, uh, from, uh, I have two dogs from Sarajevo, uh, one, one a German Shepherd Cross, and most recently, Sebastian, who is a German Shepherd Cross with a Husky. He's got the most beautiful piercing blue eyes. He spent 11 years in a shelter and never got a home. And I, I met him four years ago when I was in Bosnia, and I thought that um, he, he's such a beautiful dog. He's bound to be home very quickly. He never was. And this year, sad, very sadly, last um, March the 30th, my wife died. And uh, she was a great inspiration to me in terms of animal rights and animal welfare and compassion. And I thought I would like um, Seb to experience some of Myra's spirit. So... Um, I rescued him in June and it's the first home he's ever had and he was quite reticent when he first came for the first few months and now what I love is he's become very demanding. He's settled down and realized that this is where he lives, this is his home and now he tells me when he wants things and I just love that. It's just wonderful. So I'm really pleased. He's here. If you want to see him, I'll see if we can see him here. Just sure. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. oh, beautiful. <laughs> and, and that's Boo, who's just there. Hi, Boo. Hey, Boo. <laughs> and and Boo, Boo is the person who wants my attention. <laughs> and you may sit here. Can you give me one second? I'm going to open the door and I may go into the garden. Sure second. thing. <laughs> Uh, yes, Seb has gone in the garden, but um, but and, and now who might be following him? Um, but um, yes, they're great. I mean, I and I mean for me, I, I I don't know where I'd be this year without these wonderful creatures. They have grounded me and um, kept me focused, and um, and uh, they tell me about life. It's wonderful. They're wonderful creatures. They're, they do tell us about life and they speak to us and they have their own language. And if you actually, and, and not just the dogs and the cats that we have in our homes, but the cows and the pigs and the chickens and all of that. Um, so you just have to open up your eyes and listen and feel with your heart. And you could see that they're just Absolutely. like us. Same, Absolutely. but different. Indeed. Totally. Funnily enough, a friend of mine, a farmer who I, I, it's not too far from me here. He, um, I've been trying to tell him for years to stop um, breeding cattle for slaughter. And he, as he's a very small um, breeder, he says, no, it's mine is very sort of organic and careful. I said, it, when you take the cow into the slaughterhouse, it doesn't make any difference. It's still dreadful. 
and uh, he, I spoke to him the other day and he, he sounded changed and I said, what's happened? And he said, we just finally lost a, a, a very old cow who'd been in our family for many, many years. And she, he was not, he was breeding with her, but he, he wasn't um, sending her to slaughter. And she died. And uh, he was very, very upset about that. And he noticed that the rest of the herd came and stood on the spot where she died and they stood there for two days. And it's very touching to think about it. And he said, I'm, as a result of that, I have now decided that I'm not going to breed any more cattle for slaughter. It's just locked into him the sentience and the fact that they feel like we feel. And that's what it's all about, basically. We all have the same feelings. As you say, we have a different language, but we all feel the same. We feel love and want families and want security and want happiness and want freedom. And that's what, if that's what we want, that's what we must give to all other species as well. So that's, for me, also such a driver in terms of um, my lifestyle and being a vegan. It's wonderful. Um, wow, that just gave me uh, some goosebumps here <laughs> about that. It's just so um, touching. And I yeah. think that one of the things is that I think that we all have com that compassion in us. We yes. just have to awaken it. And Perfect. it's like we have a lock on it. And yes. it's the special key that opens it. Because for me, you know, I was until nine years ago, eight and a half years ago, I wasn't vegan. And so, but then all of a sudden, I got the connection, mm -hmm. which I hadn't had before. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I understand that. Totally understand that. It's, um, it is remarkable. I mean, I, I, I started getting that connection, strange enough, um, through one of my dogs, a dog I called DJ, who, who sadly, I, I lost um, DJ about five years ago, but he'd been in our lives for 16 years. And he um, was extraordinary. He was a, I used to call him a spolly, a, a spaniel collie cross, a spolly. He, and we called him DJ because he had a black coat and a white bib and it looked like he was wearing a dinner jacket. So, um, and, and DJ was my gatekeeper really. And he, when I used to come out back from filming or rehearsal or whatever, and he always used to greet me at the door and we'd sit down together and he felt like he was saying to me, so how's it been today? And um, <clears throat> so I'd talk to him and um, he used to put his head to one side and uh, as if he was really listening. And I mean, it's, I mean, actors love those that listen to them. So, you know, he found his way into my heart very deeply. But he, he was saying other things to me about um, sentience and understanding and, you know, there's more, there's more to me than you can just see if you look. And, um, and he's, he was true, he, he was right, there was more. So th that was the beginning also of just my sentience journey as well. And the fact, I suppose the three things that really are the words that focus my life, which is our compassion, um, empathy, and kindness. And I think it's very interesting, as you say, that we have to re-find our compassion because I think we're all born with compassion, but I think that the compassion is by our environment and our parents and our lifestyles. Our compassion is hammered, hammered out of us from a very young age. I give you a quick example of what I mean by that is that say for instance you have a child who is um, and I'm sure you may have heard this before you have a child who's playing in the garden with a rabbit and uh, when she finishes playing with the rabbit and she puts the rabbit in a cage and then she goes indoors and sees her mother and says what's for dinner mummy and 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 mummy says rabbit darling so you immediately introduce the child to a relationship with animals that is different from the relationship with her own species. And um, so that once you start that journey, once you start accepting the fact that animals are commodities and are at our disposal, and most importantly of all, you can eat them. Once you start drilling that into a child's sensibility, they lose their natural compassion and they, 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 
they start to develop a kind of speciesism, as we would call it, and a non-dimensioned compassion. And I think dimensioned compassion, and by that I mean a compassion that is all embracing, is what should be what our lives are all about. It what's, is, it, it's what directs our lives and what releases the love and the empathy that we have naturally within us that um, is corroded for so, so long in our lives. And it's, I find it every day thrilling to have um, got back in touch with um, my inner compassion and my love of other species on our planet. And so it's, uh, and all of this is directly related to choosing a plant-based lifestyle and a, and a lifestyle that's based in kindness and compassion, yeah. It's like a starburst, right? It's like one awakening, then another, and then another, and then another, and then another. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's fantastic. And also, you know, it, it, I don't just feel more compassionate about animals. I feel more compassionate about people. I care about people. I don't care about people less because I care more about animals. I care about them the same. I think we all have. I'm glad you said that because there's a misconception. Oh, you care more about animals than humans. No, we care about everything, but we're talking and speaking out for animals because they're, you know, being put in the background and people are not listening to what they're saying or not understanding their language. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Right. And it shouldn't, one is, shouldn't compete with the other and one shouldn't be exclusive of the other. It should be all embracing, basically. Correct. And I, and I believe that veganism is a social justice issue. Yes. You know, it's not, it's not really a diet. It's not a, solely an animal right. I think it's a social justice issue because it impacts so many things. It impacts humans, the planet, the animals, our health, you know, um, yes, it's racism, all in- speciesism. I mean, it's, it's just all encompassing. Yeah. I agree entirely. Absolutely. It's, it's a very broad. Right. It's not a diet, it's a lifestyle. And it's a very, very broad and embracing, embracing lifestyle. Now, to I know no, that you... I'm sorry, go ahead. It's, it's a himsa, isn't it? To do no harm, basically. Right. I was going to say, I know that you are involved in many projects helping um, animals um, and our planet. But talk to me a little bit about your For Life on Earth project uh, well for life on earth is a charity for which i'm both an ambassador and a patron and for life on earth is a science a science group who are working very hard to end the dreadful business of animal testing for human diseases using animals as models for human diseases which is a 90 percent plus failure and has been um, for however long it's been practiced. And so I'm part of a group that is trying to change the law on animal testing to bring people up to date with the failure of animal testing because even the pharmaceutical companies and even the vivisectors admit that it fails 90% of the time. Um, But it's a very, very um, good business for the people who are in it. It makes them lots of money. They get lots of, lots of funds. And, um, but it is a total failure as a, as a model for, for, for finding cures and predicting um, for human diseases. So I work um, every, every other day on campaigning for that. And I have a conversation, a debate happening in the House of Commons on February the 7th, um, which is to bring they're called the MBR Acres Dogs. They're beagle, beagles in a facility in um, in in, in uh, the countryside in London, and they are they breed two thousand beagles a year to be tested on. And these poor little beagles, they use beagles because beagles are the most compliant and human friendly dogs, and they are punished for that friendliness by being tested upon. And these poor puppies are. Um, uh, force-fed gavage, you know, which is force-feeding. They are force-fed chemicals which are put in a tube straight to their gut without any anesthetic or any pain relief at all. This goes on for 19 weeks and then they're killed. 
and it is so disgusting and it, the results are negligible. Um, so I'm trying to get them brought under the Animal Welfare Act, which means they won't be tested upon. And if that happens, I keep my fingers crossed, then that will then open the door to a bigger conversation about ending animal testing and, sh and showing the public that, that, it, that it doesn't work. We are all um, smoke screened by the science. And the, you know, and the, the usual thing is, well, are you going to choose your son or your daughter, your mother, your grandparents or an animal? And, and what they don't say, uh, you know, that do you want your, 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 this testing on this animal may save your grandmother. What they don't tell you is that 90% of the time it hasn't even got a chance of saving your grandmother. And um, so I'm raising awareness to that as best I can. And it's going very well at the moment. It's, uh, so I hope, um, I hope that uh, we achieve greater success with it. Yeah. That's great because that has to be brought out into the public that, and, and because like you said, there's a small screen. Oh, this is the way it's always been. We test on animals before we test on humans. However, if 90% is a failure rate, it means that you're really testing on humans anyway, because exactly. those results are not true. So why okay. not just let the animals be? Yeah. And use everything that you can in terms of modern science, you know, like um, organ on a you know, plate, things like that, you know, organ on a chip. And uh, there's lots of things that can be done. You don't need animal testing. And animal testing actually holds back um, drugs that may help humans. So, and if you had any other business, like if you, if you had, if 90% of all planes never took off and crashed, you'd stop using planes, wouldn't you? You definitely so, um, would. <laughs> so that's one of the things that I'm very, very committed to. Um, one of my great, great passions is Animals Asia, which is a charity that rescues bears from bile farms in Southeast Asia. I, think, I would think that's my favorite charity on the planet. They define to me the very meaning of animal rights. I'm very much, um, you know, we distinguish between animal welfare and animal rights. I'm very much an animal rights person just as I am very much a human rights person. You can't have human welfare without human rights. So you can't have animal welfare without animal rights as well. So um, and Animals Asia defines for me the very meaning of um, animal rights in the way they rescue these bears and rehabilitate them. And uh, so I'm passionate about, about that. And, uh, and about 20 odd other charities, some also, humorously known as the man who can't say no. So I, um, so I get attached to a lot of different charities. I uh, have appreciated and enjoy talking with you today. Any last words that you'd like to share with our audience? Um, yeah, I would just say to, um, I'm, I'm sure your audience is probably um, vegan leaning anyway, but if anyone who's listening isn't vegan, um, and is interested in it, I would say, do try it. Um, if you can't make a major step, then just reduce your meat intake, have meat free weekends, um, and, you, uh, and just give it a try because uh, it's not as terrible as people say it is. It's absolutely wonderful. As we said in our earlier part of our conversation, it's so good for our spirit and good for our bodies. And it is, once you get into it, the most varied and exciting way of eating. So if you're thinking about it, give it a try. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you for joining us on another episode of The Vegan Pulse. I am your host, Nancy Arenas. Remember to check out our website, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose. Live vegan. <laughs>